Hey Optimancers, Chris here. So I'm going to show you the most powerful straight bard build. So hello Eloquence Bard. And goodbye Eloquence Bard. What? Come on, we all know Eloquence Bard is the most powerful bard subclass in the game, right? I mean, I rated it the most powerful in my subclass tier ranking video. Everyone seemed to agree. Actually, no, uh, the patron of the channel, Justin Times, had a different take. And he's demonstrated to me now many times over that I've been sleeping on the most powerful bard in the game all this time. Eloquence can cause enemies to have a penalty to saving throws, and that is great. But there is a bard that can do powerful things that require concentration for other casters, but skip on that whole concentration thing. And somehow I didn't notice, but Justin Times did. When the Creation Bard first came out in Tashes, I figured it was a pretty good subclass. The animating performance feature looked like it was ripe for abuse, but Errata fixed that problem. Otherwise, I figured the Creation Bard was good, but not overwhelmingly good. My mistake. Even with the Errata, the Creation Bard is in a class by itself. I present Pocus Snowbell, our Creation Bard. So, our character is a princess. She's stuck in a big drafty castle. She's so lonely, only her songs to keep her company. As she matures, she finds company in the furniture that comes to life when she sings. Oh, happy day. She travels from the castle, inspiring all that she encounters and entertaining all with her songs. Oh, and she's super powerful. Did I mention that? Wizards look on her with envy as they see her do the things that they would just need to concentrate on so hard. But with her, she just sings them into existence and then forgets about it. So that's our character concept. And the College of Creation is going to bring this character to life in our game in a very effective way. Okay, so as usual, I'm not going to assume any campaign setting specific material in the build. So I won't be taking Silvery Barbs on this build. But if it is available in your game, I would recommend you take it. Okay, so we're a Disney style princess. Where do we start? Well, let's start with our race. Most Disney princesses are human, so let's use the variant human. Ability score increases go to Dexterity and Charisma. Bonus skill to Stealth for oh, sneaking out of the castle. For our feet, let's take Resilient Constitution. I mean, let's just take care of that right away. So we're not Sleeping Beauty, succumbing to one silly Poison Needle saving throw. That's not our character. Moving on to Ability Scores. We're going to max out Dexterity, Charisma, and Constitution. That's going to give us a plus three for each score. And the rest gets stumped. Now, our class, of course, is Bard. As for instruments, I mean, pick what you like. We're going to probably focus on singing. And for our skills, let's take Acrobatics, Perception, and Persuasion. So first level, we get Bardic Inspiration, the iconic feature of the Bard. Their bonus action to give out and can provide your ally a bonus of a D6, which scales to higher die types with level, to an ability check, saving throw, or attack roll within the next 10 minutes. There are two things that are really nice here. The first is that this, unlike some other similar features, doesn't require you fail the initial check. This means ability checks that don't have any official failure, like initiative checks, I mean specifically initiative checks, can benefit from this feature. Secondly, you don't have to declare this before the die roll. So we roll, and if we need it, then we add the die. Currently, we'll be able to give inspiration three times per long rest. How does our character inspire? <laughs> By batting her eyelashes, of course. Okay, starting spells. With cantrips, we'll grab Mage Hand. This is basically a type of telekinesis. We can do this to have our hairbrush or our hand mirror dance around us as we sing. Oh, and it is one of the better cantrips as well. Then we'll grab Minor Illusion. We sing a note, and the image appears. Also, one of the best cantrips in the game. I have a whole video devoted to this one, but in short, we create obscurement, we fool enemies, and there's utility. Okay, so first level spells. Our first selection is Sleep, and now we're a good first level character. Sleep is probably the premier spell at first level. We'll trade it out later, but at this point, Sleep just wins combats. However, we will have some other selections, but not a lot of slots. Just two first level slots at first level. So. We'll grab Healing Word, just in case somebody goes down. And we have Ritual Casting, so a spell with the Ritual Tag can be cast without a spell slot, so that's probably a good idea. Let's grab Detect Magic and Comprehend Languages. 
Detect Magic is a very useful spell. You defeat the big creature, cast his spell, and you can find the magic items in the treasure. Comprehend Languages is great utility. These are good additions to what we can do. And our background? Well, we're a noble, of course. We get a free selection, and we should probably take performance for all those days singing and dancing in the castle. On to equipment. We can pick a rapier, longsword, or any simple weapon. We'll take a light crossbow. If you want to be Merida, grab a short bow instead. So this is our action when we are casting a spell. We have a 16 dexterity, so actually we're not bad. We'll never get extra attack though, but before level five, nobody has extra attack. So as an in-between action, this is good and it keeps us at range. Eventually though, we are going to switch out to other options. We'll grab the Diplomat's Pack, a loot, and leather armor and a dagger. And of course, our pretty dress, our ring that identifies us as the princess, and a scroll too, I guess, and 25 gold pieces. Don't forget to spend one of those gold pieces on some arrows or bolts. So pretty simple at level one, two sleep spells, or maybe one and a healing word if needed. Otherwise, we're shooting for plus five to hit and d8 plus three damage. We have some handy skills, some utility spells, illusions, a minor telekinesis, and decent saves for our level. Wisdom, though, is our weak save. Not much we can do about that right now, though there is a patch we will be applying later on. Our armor class is poor, so stay out of melee. Studded leather is going to get us up to an armor class of 15. Eventually, we're going to improve that armor class, but that's kind of where we're stuck for now. Okay, so let's become a creation bard. Second level gives us magical inspiration. This was an optional class feature for bards in Tasha's Cauldron of Everything. So if you're not using those, then you don't have this. Otherwise, it's just another way to use inspiration. Now you can add the die roll to the damage of a spell or add it to the healing of a spell. We should probably talk about giving this to the wizard or sorcerer and then them casting magic missile. So according to the designers with magic missile, you roll the damage of the missiles once. Then you multiply that roll by the number of missiles that hit the target. So the question is, do we add magical inspiration before or after multiplying the initial damage? And it's not super clear. So you know what? It's worth asking your DM. If it's before, then that's a great use of inspiration dice. And if not, uh, no problem. We're also getting Song of Rest at second level. So when we take a short rest, our restful song provides an additional d6 of healing to anyone spending hit dice on the short rest. It's not a super powerful ability, but it's free, so we'll use it every short rest. And the d6 scales with level as well. Then we get Jack of All Trades. I love this feature. Basically, any time we make an ability check where we make the roll without adding our proficiency bonus, we add half our proficiency bonus. So that means half our proficiency bonus on initiative rolls, dispel magic rolls, any skill or tool that we aren't proficient with. Let's grab expertise and two skills. So we'll double our proficiency bonus to our persuasion and stealth checks. Perception would be a good choice here as well if you prefer. And we get our first creation bard feature. Mode of potential makes our inspiration supercharged. So this is automatic. So as long as our inspiration is spent on anything besides souping up a spell, we get more from it. Okay, so most bards get additional ways to spend their inspiration. Eloquence can affect saving throws. Glamour gets Mantle of Inspiration, Lore gets Cutting Words, Spirits gets Tales from Beyond, Swords gets Blade Flourish, Whispers gets Psychic Blades, and these are all good features, but they are all instead of using our inspiration as inspiration. With creation, we keep our iconic feature for its intended purpose, we just make it better. So what it comes down to is creation bards will hand out inspiration more commonly than other bards do. So when our bard uses inspiration, a magical musical note appears over the head of the person she's inspired. Or maybe it's a cute little bird. So if our inspiration die is spent on an ability check, we roll the die twice and then we use the better result. The musical note then pops emitting colorful harmless sparks. So it's basically kind of like giving your inspiration die advantage whenever we use it on an ability check. If our inspiration is spent on an attack roll, the musical note thunderously shatters and the target of the attack and each creature we choose that we can see within five feet of it must succeed on a constitution saving throw against our spell DC or take thunder damage equal to the roll of the bardic die. So we're adding both to hit and damage as well as a small area of effect. If the inspiration die is spent on a saving throw, the musical note vanishes with the sound of soft music and the creature gains temporary hit points 
equal to the number rolled plus our charisma modifier. So for now, that's a d6 plus 3, but that is going to scale with our level. So this feature is solid. Basically, takes our iconic feature and flat out improves it, no matter how we're using our inspiration. But I promised the most powerful bard, so let's get started on that. Our second feature is performance of creation. As an action, you can channel the magic of the Song of Creation to create one non-magical item of your choice in an unoccupied space within 10 feet of you. The item must appear on a surface or in a liquid that can support it. The gold piece value of the item can't be more than 20 times your bard level, and the item must be medium or smaller. So at our level now, that's up to 60 gold pieces of value. The item glimmers softly, and a creature can faintly hear music when touching it. The created item disappears after a number of hours equal to your proficiency bonus. For examples of items you can create, see the equipment chapter of the player's handbook. Once you create an item with this feature, you can't do so again until you finish a long rest, unless you expand a spell slot of second level or higher to use this feature again. You can only have one item created by this feature at a time. If you use this action and you already have an item from this feature, the first one immediately vanishes. Now this feature is going to get better as we level up, but even now at third level, this is probably better than any spell your wizard can cast. So here's our party. We just got set upon by a bunch of enemies. Our turn comes up, what can we do? Well, we can use our action and maybe place an iron gate right here. Now maybe the DM says the gate can be attached to the entranceway, and maybe they don't. So if they don't, fine. A 5x5 five five lump of wood or block of stone then. There's no way that's worth more than 60 gold pieces. In our case, maybe it's a 60 gold piece wardrobe. At a minimum, it's not going to be easy to move out of the way. And in the meantime, we basically have a wall separating our enemies that we aren't concentrating on. You know, the kind of thing a ninth level wizard can do using their concentration, except we're not going to be using our concentration. This feature is just going to get better and better as well. I've been told before that bards don't have good second level spell options. I personally disagree. Shatter, Suggestion, Pyrotechnics, Phantasmal Force, Mirror Image, Locate Object, Heat Metal, Blindness, Deafness. The problem isn't that we don't have any good spells. The problem is we only have two second level spell slots. So we're going to grab Aid and Nather's Mischief. Okay, so Aid is amazing. Add to maximum hit points of three creatures, but also add to their current hit points and they can be up to 30 feet away. So that's 15 hit points of in-combat healing split three ways as an action. Then, after you can recover hit points out of combat, the increased maximum comes into play. This spell scales with level amazingly as well. It's five additional hit points per creature per spell level. Nather's Mischief, I think, is a spell that hasn't seen nearly enough play since it was released in Fizbin's Treasury of Dragons. We fill a 20-foot cube with the effect, and when we cast a spell, we roll a d4 to determine the effect. We roll again at the start of each of our turns while we concentrate on the spell. If we roll a 1, it's a mass charm. If we roll a 2, it's a mass blind. If we roll a 3, it's mass incapacitation and random movement. 3 is the best one, I figure. And if we roll a 4, it's difficult terrain. One thing that's really nice about this versus other status effects is we can also move it 10 feet in any direction on our turn so we can keep it over our enemies and roll randomly to see how we mess them up that turn. We should probably switch out sleep now. Let's grab command. Basically, when you cast command on someone, if they fail their saving throw, they're going to lose a turn. Beyond that, maybe they fall prone or move in a direction you want or drop something they're carrying. Those are just kind of additions to taking them out of the fight for a round. There's no concentration and looky here at the casting at higher levels portion one additional target for each spell level. This spell doesn't use concentration, and in a lot of ways, it's better than Tasha's Mind Whip because we're completely removing their turn rather than just hindering it. People are starting to wake up to this spell. At this level, by the way, still worth shooting our crossbow when we have nothing else to do. With six spell slots and our performance of creation feature, we should be able to do something dramatic in every combat in even longer adventuring days. So let's move on to level six. Let's start with our ability score improvement at 4. Here I'm liking getting our armor class into line, so let's grab moderately armored. A breastplate and shield keeps our stealth without disadvantage and brings us up to a respectable 18 armor class. Now equipping a shield means we're not using a crossbow on our turn, 
But you know what? By level 6, it's not doing much for us anyways. So we can also increase our strength or dexterity. It really doesn't matter. We'll grab a point of dexterity, I guess. At super high levels, we might be able to get another point of dexterity. But for the portion of this character that we're going to be going over today, it's going to stick at an odd number. Then we get the fantastic Font of Inspiration. This gives us our inspiration points back on a short rest. So even with one short rest per day, that's twice the inspiration. Oh, and our inspiration die increases from a d6 to a d8 at the same time. So inspiration got a huge boost. Counter Charm is pretty weak, but basically if you use your action, it can give you and your allies advantage on saving throws against being frightened or charmed until the end of our next turn. It's not a limited resource, but it is a pretty weak feature. So let's move on. Okay, so animating performance. Let me go through what it does, talk about potential abuse, explain how the errata prevents that abuse, and then talk about why this is fantastic even without exploits. So, as an action, we animate one large or smaller non-magical item within 30 feet of us that isn't being worn or carried. Originally, that distinction wasn't there, which meant technically nothing was preventing you from animating your opponent's armor or their weapon. What they did with the Rada, the object targeted now can't be worn or carried. The object then uses the dancing item stat block and obeys our commands for one hour, unless it's reduced to zero hit points or we die. Like with most pets, it takes its turn immediately after ours, and it can move and use a reaction, and then it dodges with its action without anything required by us. But if we use our bonus action, we can command it to use its force-empowered slam on its turn, or some other action. When we hand out inspiration, we can also command the item just as if we had used our bonus action for that. After we use this feature, we can't use it again until we finish a long rest, unless we expand a third level or higher spell slot, which honestly is a pretty good deal. So let's look at our dancing item. Large size or smaller? It's a construct. 16 armor class, which is decent for a pet. 10 hit points plus 5 times our bard level. So at level 6, that's 40 hit points. Spells like aid can increase that though. Speed is 30 feet, and we get a 30 foot fly speed with hover. Good strength, immune to poison and psychic damage, immune to charmed, exhaustion, poisoned, or frightened. It has a 60 foot dark vision understands the languages we speak, is immune to any spell that would alter its form, and it can increase or decrease the walking speed of any creature that starts its turn within 10 feet of the item. And then it has an attack option. It's a melee attack for d10 plus or proficiency bonus force damage. We might use this occasionally, but I would say most of the time we wouldn't bother. So what would a Disney princess do with this feature? Well, obviously she would fly on it. We find a bed, a table, a carpet, things that are everywhere. Then we get on top, it's large sized, and we can fly around with hover. Now it takes its turn right after ours, so we take our actions, get on the bed, and then fly at a range of our enemies. We can also fly our allies around. You'll want to check with your DM how many allies the item could reasonably carry. I mean, with a large sized item, four medium sized creatures would fit on it, but your DM will let you know if it can actually carry four creatures, but one creature shouldn't be a problem. So now at level six, we have concentration free flight. Okay, so I would like to talk a little bit about the mechanics here, because I think it's important not to say that you have a fly speed, because what's happening is you're on top of another creature and it has a fly speed and it has a distinct turn from yours. So the default way this works is you stand on the carpet on your turn, you don't really move, you take your actions as normal, and once your turn is over, then the magic carpet would take its turn and it could move you. And sometimes that's fine, but sometimes that is not ideal. Uh, and ideally, we would want to have the option to move on our turn. So there are two ways this can be handled. Uh, the first isn't certain. The second is certain. Uh, so the one that isn't certain is talk to your DM and ask if our magic carpet could be treated as a mount. Uh, and if we are treating it as a mount, we could use the controlled mount rules. The controlled mount rules say that uh, basically the creature takes its turn immediately when we control it on our turn. Uh, Jeremy Crawford's talked about how controlled mounts work. Essentially, uh, their turn suddenly overlaps with ours and we can interchange our actions and our movements. So although we have two distinct turns, 
we can have that carpet move on our turn. And so that is perfect. And that is kind of the ideal solution. And then the carpet can still dash, disengage, or dodge. I probably want to dodge most of the time because we want our carpet to be safe. But we can't be guaranteed our DM's going to say yes. Our DM might say no, uh, that's not the same as a mount. So we're not going to be using the mounted combat rules. We still have another workaround, uh, and this is 100% legal. So what we would do is, uh, first off, this isn't a bonus action hungry character. It takes a bonus action to command our carpet, but if we give out inspiration with our bonus action, that also counts for commanding the carpet. So we could command the carpet every turn, it's no problem. And what we would do is, on our turn, we would take our actions as normal, and what we would do is we would command the carpet to ready a movement to take place on our following turn. Uh, and then, once our turn is over, the carpet can move as normal and then uses its action to ready that movement. Then our following turn comes around and the carpet can move again. And we take our action as normal and we use our bonus action again. And then after our turn is over, then the carpet can move again. So we're getting two movements, one on our turn, one after our turn, and it readies its action again. The only real downside here is uh, that it, it is essentially keeping the carpet from dodging. And honestly, I'd rather have it be dodging. So if we can get the control mount rules, that's probably better. But here, this is still pretty good. It, basically, you're moving twice. So one way or the other, we can have it move on our turn. Oh, and here's a little trick as well. Uh, so let's say there's a carpet that is unattended on the floor, but maybe one of your enemies is standing on it. So we use our animating performance on the carpet and that carpet is not being worn or carried. Uh, so now that carpet can take its action and it has one of our enemies on it. So maybe it lifts them way up into the air. Uh, maybe it lifts them up into the air and then dumps them off. Maybe it just flies away. Now, don't get me wrong. Uh, for an enemy to be standing on a carpet that we can then animate, in a standard combat is unlikely. Uh, so this isn't something that's gonna come up very often, but I thought it was worth mentioning. So the reason why I think animating performance is so powerful is it is giving you the ability to do something that is normally requiring concentration without concentration, and that is the ability to fly. I mean, if you're a wizard or a sorcerer and you wanna fly at level six, you're casting the fly spell, and then you're concentrating. Uh, and we don't have to concentrate. Now, there are some options that could get you concentration free flight at level six. Other than this, uh, first off, we could just choose a race that gets flight. So, uh, you know, you're an Aarakocra. Well, then you have concentration free flight all the time. Uh, the other option is uh, there are some certain subclasses that can do it for you. The Genie Pact Warlock and the Twilight Cleric both get a limited concentration free flight at level six as well. Uh, so those are two other options. That's basically it. Speaking of concentration free, let's look at performance of creation again, because now we can create a large item and a large item with a value of up to 120 gold pieces. We're starting to get into some really interesting options now. I mean, I wonder how much a large size safe is worth, because if it's 120 gold pieces or less, then we can create a safe around an opponent with them locked inside, or maybe just a large size crate with our opponent inside, or a large sized cage. This has no concentration. And after we use it for free, we can use it again by expending a second level spell slot. That's an amazing deal. And yeah, it keeps getting better, but the price to use it never goes up. Okay, so we gave up our crossbow to use a shield. So we need to fill in an option for our action when we have nothing else to do. So let's pick up Vicious Mockery now. It's not great, but it is a fill in option. Now let's look at level three spells. How do bards fare? Well, first off, let's grab Leoman's Tiny Hut. Amazing spell. And it's a ritual, so we can cast it without expending a spell slot. Pretty much the best long rest or even short rest protection spell until very high levels. Beyond that, so many great options. Dispel Magic is a fantastic spell and Jack of All Trades makes it even better. Fear is terrific. Though, honestly, I don't see our Disney princess using the fear spell. Now, Hypnotic Pattern, yeah, we sing and they're enthralled. So let's pick that up. 120 foot range, 30 foot cube. Everyone in the cube makes a wisdom saving throw. If they fail, they're incapacitated and have a speed of zero. 
there are no additional saving throws. They remain incapacitated until either they take damage, someone uses their action to wake them up, or the spell ends. One spell no one left, and we'll grab plant growth. The plants here are princess singing and grow large and strong. And they slow our enemies by 75% with no saving throw. And there's no concentration. And the area is a 100 foot radius. And it lasts forever. Because it's instantaneous, it can't even be dispelled. Now, you need plants to be there in the first place. But any combats on grass, moss, or any plant covered natural terrain is applicable. The spell says you can exclude one or more areas of any size within the spell's area from being affected. So, because of that, we can do neat tricks like this that cause large creatures to be unable to avoid the plant growth areas, but our medium-sized party members can just move in between without being hindered. And there's no concentration for this spell. And slowing by 75% is pretty amazing. The spell says specifically a creature moving through the area must spend 4 feet of movement for every 1 foot it moves. So, this salamander wants to move. It moves 5 feet, and now it's used up 20 feet of movement. If it wants to move again, it's going to need to dash. Well, that's all our known spells, but an honorable mention to slow as well. There is no friendly fire, and we can really mess up our enemies. In fact, if we find that charm immunity is causing problems at higher levels, switching out hypnotic pattern for slow is a pretty good higher level move. I hesitate to throw out specific levels here, but basically, if you're casting hypnotic pattern and come across charm immunity, say a couple times in a row, it's probably a good time to consider the switch. Also, if someone else can cast Lehman's Tiny Hut, I would strongly consider Dispel Magic as well. Like I said, Dispel Magic is just better with Jack of All Trades because if you try to dispel a spell of 4th level or higher, it's an ability check where we wouldn't add our proficiency modifier. So, let's grab that. At this level, we have 10 spell slots, a free use of Performance of Creation, a free use of Animating Performance, so we won't be stuck using Vicious Mockery all that often. But let's keep going and look at level 10, where some other amazing things happen. So first, at level 8, we get an ability score improvement, and it's time to focus on Charisma. We have good armor class, boosted saving throws, so we focused on defense. Now let's get that spell DC up and add an Inspiration die. Speaking of which, our Inspiration die becomes a D10 at level 10. We also get expertise in two more skills. I've chosen Perception and Acrobatics, and we get Magical Secrets. This is one of the best Bard features. We can choose two spells known of up to 5th level from any spell list. So the first spell I'm recommending is Find Greater Steed. This is a 4th level Paladin spell, so a 10th level Paladin doesn't have the spell yet, and basically it gives us a flying mount. And yeah, you're thinking, but you already have a flying mount. Yeah, but we're a bard, we help the party. So our princess sings, and a pretty pegasus hears her call, and comes to make friends. Then the party barbarian, or fighter, now has a flying mount. Or, we could give a wry smile and lend it to the party paladin. Oh, that's humiliating. The bard is making your fine greater steed for you. If you want another option though, counterspell is a great choice. Jack of all trades applies here as well, if we're countering a spell of 4th level or higher. If I was in a campaign where we're coming up against spellcasters a lot, I might go counterspell over fine greater steed, honestly. In fact, take a look at the rest of your party. If nobody else has counterspell, you should probably take it. But often somebody else is going to have it, in which case we can probably live without it. But either way, for my first Magical Secrets pick, it's definitely either Find Greater Steed or Counterspell. But our second spell, this one is for sure. This is our big play, Telekinesis. So this works for us in a lot of ways. First off, it's a good spell. Fifth level, Concentration, good duration of 10 minutes, and we gain Telekinesis for the duration. What can we do with it? Well, first off, we can use our action to restrain a creature. That's a contested ability check, our charisma versus their strength. If they fail, they're restrained, and we can move them 30 feet in any direction, including just holding them 30 feet in the air. The only restriction is the range of the spell, which is 60 feet. On following rounds, we can attempt to maintain our grip on the target, or switch targets. In either case, that uses our action again. So like I said, this spell is a perfect fit for us. We have two 5th level spell slots, so a long duration spell we can potentially use for multiple combats is a great choice. It uses concentration, but our animating performance and our performance of creation don't use concentration, so it's not really conflicting with those. 
uses our action every turn. So what? No vicious mockery? I don't see that as a problem. Now we have a good action for combat every turn. And our Jack of All Trades feature works on ability checks, so our opponent makes a strength check, but we make a charisma check plus half our proficiency bonus. So we're better at this than other casters. And since the opponent is making a strength check and not a strength saving throw, we don't care if they have legendary resistance. Legendary resistance doesn't work for ability checks. If they fail, we've got them. Oh, and we're not done. We can also use telekinesis on an object of up to a thousand pounds. We can potentially pull an item that is worn or carried away from an enemy. Again, it's an opposed ability check. And then we can steal the opponent's weapon, the wizard's staff, or their component pouch if that's what they're using. So yeah, more fun options. Oh, and if a pegasus and a magic carpet aren't enough, well, then we can use telekinesis to give party members a third option to fly on. This is a perfect spell for us. But let's go over our bard spell picks. So we get another cantrip, take your pick. I've grabbed light, but if you want another spell, it's probably just as good. So keep in mind that our fifth level spell slots are usually gonna go to telekinesis. So I want a couple fourth level options. First and foremost, Dimension Door, super useful. So we'll grab that for sure. This is a pretty long range teleport. We can bring along a friend and it doesn't use concentration or require line of sight. Often it's the case where an ally is in trouble that I use Dimension Door. So we start our turn on our flying carpet. It readied its action last turn to move on our turn. So it moves us closer to the ally. We also boost our walking speed by 10 so we can run up to our ally, cast Dimension Door, appear on top of our flying carpet with our ally, then right after our turn, our carpet moves 30 feet away with both of us to safety and readies its action to move on our turn again the next turn. Second spell, Polymorph. Now we can't use this while concentrating on telekinesis, but Polymorph can win a fight or save an ally. I'd grab this at seventh level when it's the most potent, but it's still an okay spell at level 10. Now the spell that probably fits our theme best is Animate Objects. Though, like I said, Telekinesis is probably using up our fifth level spell slots anyways. So let's go in another direction entirely and grab Rary's Telepathic Bond. This is a ritual spell. I find this spell comes in really handy and we're not using up a resource to keep this up pretty much all the time. We're moving on to 14th level. This is where I'm actually going to end this build. So at level 12, we're going to max out our Charisma score at last. So that's the maximum spell DC as well as five inspirations per short rest. Then we get Magical Secrets again. If you want to break the campaign, Simulacrum is our choice. I'm going to assume we like our campaign and our character, so I'm going to make some less game-breaking selections. First up, Contingency. You might have noticed that one weakness this character has is a low Wisdom saving throw, and we can't really get proficiency there. Now when it comes to Wisdom saving throws, the effects that happen most often are Frightened and Charmed. Frightened actually isn't a problem for us, we don't make attack rolls, so that's no problem. And we actually don't move closer to enemies very often either. Our carpet does, and our carpet is immune to Frightened. We're happy slinging spells and effects from a distance. And so, yeah, Frightened, unless it's also using up our action, isn't really a problem. But Charmed could be a problem, especially if we're talking about getting Hypnotic Patterned, Dominated, or hit with a lowly Tasha's Hideous Laughter. So let's grab Contingency. This is a 6th level Wizard spell. So we cast this and select a spell of 5th level or lower that we can cast with a casting time of one action that can target us. We then select a trigger, and when that trigger happens, the spell takes effect. And that spell can't be counterspelled, by the way, because it's already been cast. And the duration? 10 days. So lots of time to do this between adventuring. So here's what we want to do. So we're going to cast Contingency out of combat, then we're going to tie it to a spell that's going to help us when we fail that wisdom saving throw. And I think we have two decent spell options here, and whichever one we pick, we better make sure to learn that spell. First option is Calm Emotions. So Calm Emotions is a concentration spell, second level. It can target us and is one action casting. It suppresses both the Charmed and Frightened Condition for its duration. So if we use this spell, we could set the trigger as when we become Charmed or Frightened. Or if you aren't concerned about being Frightened, just when we become Charmed. The nice thing here is that we're basically immune to both Frightened and Charmed for the duration, and we don't care if it's a spell being cast on us or just an effect. And if we're hit with the effect again, no problem. The problem is it uses a concentration. The second option, an option I'm going to use on this character, 
is Dispel Magic. We might as well cast the Dispel Magic at 5th level so it automatically works on 5th level spells or lower. Nice thing here is we also get that Jack of All Trades bonus and we're not limited to Charmed and Frightened. So maybe the trigger is something like when I'm unwillingly under the effects of a spell that prevents me from taking my action on my turn. Then we're covering things like Whole Person or Whole Monster as well. It's not a perfect solution for a lower Wisdom saving throw, but it's something. But if you want to go counter spell instead, that's also a reasonable option. Okay, and for our second Magical Secret selection, I'm liking Heal. Straight 70 hit points of healing at range with one action, and it doesn't use our concentration. If we're supporting our party, and let's face it, that's what we're doing, then Heal is a top tier pick, and we can use it between our telekinesis actions without interrupting our concentration. Once again, if you prefer a counterspell here, that's also a good option. But speaking of one action casts that don't use concentration, let's pick up Mass Suggestion as our 6th level bard pick. It's one of the best 6th level spells in the game. Affects up to 12 enemies, no friendly fire, suggests they run away or join our team or surrender, one saving throw only, and it lasts 24 hours. And our 7th level pick is Force Cage, one action casting, no concentration, so it's not interfering with telekinesis, and we could trap an enemy for an hour. Actually, we could already do that, but now we could trap another enemy. An enemy that can't teleport is basically helpless against this spell, and there's no saving throw to avoid being caught. And even if they can teleport, they have to make a saving throw to teleport out of the Force Cage. Where Force Cage is going to be better than our performance of creation is that it can be even bigger. And speaking of teleportation, let's pick up Teleport as our final selection. Take your party anywhere, basically. One of the best utility spells in the game, and as a middle of combat quick getaway, it can be handy too. Also, don't forget, we need Dispel Magic, so let's go ahead and unprepare one of those first level rituals. I'll take away Detect Magic, though you could take away Comprehend Languages, that'd be fine as well. And we're going to pick up Dispel Magic with it. But 14th level keeps on giving. Let's go back to our subclass features, because we get Creative Crescendo, provides the College of Creation bar the ability to use Performance of Creation to create multiple items, in our case five items at once, though only one of them can be maximum size and the rest are small or tiny. So, I mean, there's probably some utility value there. But the bigger thing is, we've spent a lot of the game asking our DM, how much does a large size steel safe cost? How much does a block of stone cost? Now we don't have to ask, as we are no longer limited by gold piece value. Oh, and performance of creation just got better again. We can now create a huge item. So that is nine squares of item we can create with our action. And so our character at 14th level is looking pretty sweet. I mean, we're a full caster. We're getting into the high level spells. Uh, when we go on to 15th level and beyond, uh, we're basically just the bard. We're not getting any more subclass features. And we get magical secrets again at level 18. On the bard list, we have True Polymorph. It's definitely one of the most powerful 9th level spells in the game. So it's not like this character stops being good at level 14. In fact, it is one of the best characters you can possibly have at high levels. But I wanted to really focus on what creation gives us over other bard subclasses. So that is how you play a Disney princess in D&D. This character will perform well at any optimized table. Her mobility options are fantastic. Basically, concentration-free, near unlimited flight at level 6. And performance of creation is like a concentration-free cage or wall. It just gets better and better as we level up. So thanks to Justin Times for waking me up as to the potential of the College of Creation. I hope this video gets you thinking about some concepts for your own creation bard. Otherwise, until next time, I'm going to sit back, relax, and have some fun. D&D is for everyone. Thanks, everybody, and I'll talk to you soon.